So if we could invite our panellists up, and Kylie, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. We'll just give everyone a few moments to sit down in the chair so you have a bit of a wiggle, a bit of a stretch of your legs if you need them. Thank you, Carleen, for the wonderful presentation. It was, it, it, it just brings me back to sort of the days when I was in the clinical area as well, and yeah, some of the same things used to happen back then. So welcome everyone. This is uh, the panel discussion session. So we are going to um, follow on the theme of fundamentals of care and we've invited some key people from across the state to join us in that, in that discussion. So with us today we have Carleen Thornton, which we've just heard from this morning. So Carleen's the academic lead of nursing teaching at the College of Nursing and Health Sciences at Flinders University. We have Scott King, who has a very long title of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> going to that. the Advanced Nursing That's Director, right. Nursing Education That's Research, right. Clinical and Professional Practice and Workforce at Carlin. So lots of hats there. Uh, we have Rebecca Pearl, who is the Clinical Practice Director at Carlin. We have Susan Dwyer, who's the Nursing Director of Education Research and Practice Development at Narlin. And we have Lisa Water, welcome, um, who is the Clinical Practice, uh, sorry, the Assistant Director of Nursing of Wards at St Andrews. So it's great that we've got a diverse um, perspective. So we've got the representation from across the health networks, from both um, private and public, as well as dif the different sectors. We've got people here from the education sector as well as from um, the clinical practice area. So to, what we're going to do is I've, when you registered, you were asked a couple of questions. One was around the barriers that you were experiencing and facing, and then if you had any questions you'd like the panel to answer. I've collated those sort of questions, um, and I'll be asking some of those questions to the panel to begin with, and then we'll be opening up for open discussion. So really want everybody to get engaged and, and be part of this discussion here. So to start off, oh, to start off with, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, summarise the barriers so that we're all talking about the same thing. Some of the barriers that the participants here have flagged as being um, a, an issue or a, a concern for them. Um, and I guess a lot of these won't be surprising for, for people. So um, some of the barriers and, or challenges were around staff shortages, a lack of resources, a lack of time, which we've been um, heard about today. Uh, some are still students, so they're coming from still learning and from that perspective not in the workforce yet. Uh, communication challenges, so not being clear in our communication. Uh, challenges with engaging staff or changing behaviour. Uh, the inexperience of staff is causing some concerns and issues as well. Uh, there was quite a lot of uh, comments in regards to culture, such as shifting mindset or people just not being interested or um, wanting to upskill or learn more about fundamentals of care. Um, and accessing evidence-based in information at the point of care, which Susan and I were talking about this morning as well. So that's sort of some of the, I guess, the challenges that I can see people have been nodding their heads as I've been talking. So obviously that everybody sort of feels that across the way. So to start with, I wanted to just ask the question to, so I'm, I'm going to just open it up to the panel, but this is aimed at those who are addressed in the clinical practice areas. So noting that what those, some of those challenges are. In your area, are you experiencing the same challenges? And what ca have you done, um, or can you provide examples of, what can you do or have you done to foster a culture that prioritises fundamentals of care and looks at the changing the behaviour, the m shifting that mindset? So for those that are in clinical practice, I might start with you, Sue. Um, sure. um, so I guess, oh, can you hear me okay? Um, from my perspective, um, I approach fundamentals of care with a person-centred practice um, philosophy and so that means it has to start with me. So myself as a leader, how do my values and beliefs align to the um, organisational and statewide values of how we provide care? Um, and then um, it's how I lead and work with the staff um, around what's our shared vision um, for implementing person-centred practice. So re really starting at that, um, as Carleen mentioned, around leadership, um, making sure our shared vision is visible and understood. And so then we start to, it, it's very much a multi-pronged approach. It's starting to embed person-centred practice in all levels of what we do. So we've certainly, um, in our orientation, we have a fundamentals of care, um, pick the 
what, I, think, I can't remember what we call it, but pick what's not right. We do some simulations out in there. In our graduate um, study days, we have a consumer come and talk to the new graduates about their experience, which comprehends, um, she threads through comprehensive care, which is a lot around fundamentals of care. And we're going to follow that up um, in the last study day to look at the impact of that story and how it might have um, changed or influenced the way they provided care. We very much um, collaborate and include and participate with the workforce around fundamentals of care. So we've been running a lot of world cafes, asking the workforce, and, and everything that's been said today is coming out in, in what I'm um, telling you now. Um, and also we have a, a joint uh, research positions and our research is focusing on um, fundamentals of care and the same themes are coming out. So I think it's looking at it at all levels, but it also uh, requires an action. So we know what the themes are, we know what the issues are, so what are we going to do about it? And Carleen said that at the end, what's our next action? So very much um, in the clinical space, it's starting to pay attention to workplace culture. How do we build effective workplace culture? And um, through the, uh, the leadership um, within education and research at Narlan, we're looking at a, a practice development approach to that, um, implementing person-centered practice, where everybody matters and we evaluate what matters. And you know those two really important questions What's it like to be cared for here? What's it like to work here? And if we have well staff working in an effective workplace culture, they'll be able to provide excellent care um, that our community deserves. So it's not just a, a one way. There's multiple, I think, um, perspectives to look at. I hope that wasn't too long. No. <laughs> and, and Lisa, or I mean, um, very much right the speaking. same as what you were saying. And actually, today is uh, what matters to you, Day. It's an Look international that. That's perfect timing, um, isn't it? <laughs> day. And um, at St Andrews, we we've been uh, celebrating what matters to you, Day, for oh, about the last three years. So we include our graduates in that program. So we get all the graduate nurses together. Um, and we talk to them about, you know, what the day is and we actually send them out and it's about asking patients what matters to them and encouraging mm -hmm. a deep listening with patients and building relationships and, you know, um, then sharing that with the whole, whole hospital or the whole nursing team. So what we do is we collate those, thing, those things that matter to patients and we display them on a big tree so everybody can see them in the hospital and feel that um, they're a part of, you know, delivering those things that patients want and what matters to patients. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and I might just add that for surgery in Carlin, we certainly do see the challenges and barriers um, for nurses to make sure that they are delivering the fundamentals every day. I think that, you know, over the last five or ten years, um, I think that we've seen things shift to more of a KPI and finance um, uh, view. Um, I know that that certainly gets more screen time in performance meetings and stuff like that. Um, so I think one of my roles is to help the nursing workforce look at what barriers and challenges they have. Um, really importantly to, you know, provide the evidence base of what we're doing and why. 99% um, and I'll speak for surgery nurses, come to work to do a good job to look after patients and make a difference. They don't come to forget fundamentals and you know, really negatively impact the patient experience. So my role in this, I see, is trying to um, challenge some of those policy and system issues, um, work on the culture that makes it easy um, or easier for uh, nurses to deliver the fundamentals of care every day and then also I think show them the impact that that has um, on the patient, not just experience, but health outcome. Um, some of the things we've done is we've looked at mouth care, which you think is really, really easy. Well, half the wards didn't have toothbrushes and toothpaste, so if the patient came in through emergency, they don't pack their toothbrush and toothpaste in an emergency. Um, so we made sure they had at least stocks of those. We had tooth fairies that would go around with a pink vest to make sure that people had had it. Um, and because we do live in this world of being able to prove what you do, um, one of the big gaps was we know that a lot of nurses do the fundamentals of care, but we can't evidence it. Yeah. Um, and we don't ask the patients about what difference that made to them. So we're doing a lot of work on trying to make sure that the Sunrise EMR electronic patient record 
works with them, not against them, because at the moment it doesn't really synchronise with what they need to do. So um, that's my role as a clinical practice director, to try and facilitate those discussions between what the nurses need to be able to do it mm -hmm. in their everyday workflow to then the system policy resourcing issues that prevent them from doing it. Colin, can I? Yeah, oh, it seems very sequential, and it's not meant to be like that, honestly. Um, so I guess just, and I, and I think about this a lot, which is kind of sad in a way, um, but I, I think too sometimes it's about switching the narrative and changing mindsets. So we have this, this, this culture that exists that says, particularly at certain uh, networks, that our consumer group is very complex. And when you say, I've got a very complex consumer group, you don't think about fundamentals. You think about all the high-tech, sexy stuff, um, like infusions. I don't even know if they're sexy, but it's sexier than <laughs> mouth care, maybe. Um, but I think we need to challenge the concept of complex. So um, a, a little story, because I like stories. Um, there was a, a hospital that moved eight years ago. I don't know which one it was. And um, as this hospital moved down the road, um, I was having a conversation with one of, um, it was a senior leader, only very, fairly recently, uh, who kept saying to me, Scott, our consumer group is so, more co so much more complex now, we've moved down the road. And I'm like, okay. But what that made me think about is that if this leader is continually saying to people, we are more complex, 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 and that leader saying that to um, the guys on the floor, that's all they're going to start to believe, is that we have a very complex group of people, and with complexity comes sexy interventions, which means it's almost an excuse to say fundamentals aren't that important anymore. And, and as an elite netball coach, as some people in the audience know, which I'm not really, elite. we elite, and not really elite at all. Um, but you know, we know that like every good netball coach will say you win a game by doing basics right. So we know too that if we can flip the narrative within the system and get people thinking differently, um, and as a woundy, um, if we do good skincare practices, people don't get pressure injuries. If people don't get pressure injuries, their length of stay of less. If their length of stay of less, we don't ramp. If we don't ramp, people don't die. And it's all because of fundamentals. Right, but it, we've got to flip that narrative, and I think we need to completely shatter our mindset and stop, and, and as, as a leadership group, move away from this concept of complexity all the time, and it's, the, it's what it is. And it, I think it seems to me too, it, it's around the language that we use as 100%. well. So, I mean, I think Carleen, you picked that up as well, just like our basic needs. Mm. Um, so I think it's being really mindful of the language that we're using when we're talking about fundamentals of care and, and care of the patient as well. Um, can I just add that I think in terms of that culture and the message, we need to be having a stronger voice, like you're saying, it, nurses need to be at the table, but to promote that awareness with nurses, and I think nurses know, but just to remind um, the leadership team that when you do the fundamentals, you have a more content patient who generally is more settled um, in the care, sort of, you know, and potentially less time um, for the nurses. But if we do the fundamentals correctly, that actually creates um, shorter length of stays mm -hmm. and less complications. So, um, you know, if the almighty dollar and um, um, KPIs are important, uh, fundamentals of care is absolutely essential if you want to have any change in that dollar value. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I think my next question probably can follow on from that, actually, because mm. you said if we do the fundamentals of care properly, and that comes back to people knowing how to do fundamentals of care properly, being trained and learning how to do that. So for those of you that are in the education sector, uh, how, how do you go about integrating the importance of fundamentals of care into both the theoretical and the practice so that the, the nurses, the undergraduate nurses that are coming out are entering the workforce with the skills that they need to do this properly? Can you solve all our issues? <laughs> um, no, because this potentially is a yeah. wicked problem. So <laughs> we're not going to be able to solve it just through where I work, um, which is in the undergraduate um, setting. But certainly within our curriculum, fundamentals of care is a key tenant within our undergraduate nursing curriculum. And it's threaded throughout the three years. And we actually scaffold it across those three years um, for our students. We've been quite intentional and in linking the fundamentals of care framework back into almost every topic that we have within our um, uh, curriculum. Um, very much so, um, we've got it embedded within our uh, PEP topics, so when we do the intensives prior to the students coming out on to do their placement, part of their assessment actually is around evaluating their ability to implement and demonstrate the fundamentals of care. 
Um, we've been quite intentional, certainly um, I taught a topic in third year um, and every tute I'd have the fundamentals of care framework up and we would talk about all those cases there today we talked about and we would dissect them about where, what went wrong and which aspect of that framework were we not delivering on, okay, so that they can start to see that they're going to be working in a system which is quite large and dynamic and they, they're going to be one individual um, in this large, huge organisation system, but that the system in itself can actually assist them to be successful or it can actually put barriers in place to be successful. But, but they as individuals who are going to be at the core of that framework still have a role to play in promoting fundamental care and establishing a relationship with a patient, a therapeutic relationship with a patient. Um, and that that is so important and the communication skills that they need to develop are so um, key to establishing that relationship. Uh, it's some interesting how many people can't really communicate very well. You know, we, we're adults, we, we expect we're going to communicate and I'm finding that that's not a gift or a skill that, that comes naturally. So we have to teach people how to communicate. We have to teach them how to think and link and we need to be able to you know, demonstrate that through the continuum of their program. What then sometimes happens, and I can talk about this, but my um, clinically situated colleagues might um, not be happy, is that these students are only going to be as good as the people they see and are working along, or uh, uh, have looking after them, supervising them when they're out on clinical placement. So at an undergraduate level, we tell the students all these things and the expectations we have of them, and then they'll go out onto clinical placement. And if you're working in an organisation where the culture does not support fundamental care, the culture does not support wellbeing, the culture doesn't support compliance with the medication policy, the culture doesn't support that we're actually going to identify when we've got episodes of poor care, the culture doesn't support reporting, then those students are going to see that. And then when they graduate, they think actually, well, what were we taught at uni? That's one thing. What actually happens on the floor? That's the reality. And then when I go back out on the floor as a TP, TPP, or an RM1 in my first, second, or third year, that's what I'm going to do. So if all they see is task and time, and not think and link, and they work in an org or have a placement and then go work in an organisation that doesn't value patient-centred care, it's really difficult for us at the very start to continue that momentum all the way through. So all the aspects of a nurse's journey through their career development trajectory and through their study trajectory all need to link together and be working for the same outcome yeah. and that is putting patients first, really making sure that fundamental care or person-centred care is the essence of what everyone is trying to achieve. So we're all, we're all linking and thinking yeah. so that the students can link and think when they become graduates. Excellent. That mentoring and coaching is really, really important and you know as registered nurses on the floor you have such a important part to play in the, the future of the people that you're working with. It's really important. I was just going to say I'd, um, I would agree, Carleen, and I'd love to see um, us strengthening our partnership with the universities when students come out. Um, also to understand their experience. So when, you know, when we talk about what's it like to work here, what's it like to have a clinical experience here? You know, how are we um, placing the value on fundamentals of care on the placement and not just the task and technology. Um, how are we um, connecting with what they're learning in theory to their practice? Um, and we're, we're trying to r r raise that visibility in our organisation and um, ha having like focus groups on clinical placements, just asking about the experience. And when you hear a student say, oh, I'm in this space, I'm not going to be able to learn very much here. That, that's a concern, you know, um, what, 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 are the, what fundamentals aren't happening or how do, can we put the focus on that? So it's understanding all the clinical places where experiences are happening and how can we bring those fundamentals of care to life, but the leaders have to value it. If the leaders aren't valuing it, um, it's not visible and we have to make it visible And because it only becomes visible when there's an SLS, an incident, an issue. And like you were saying, Rebecca, is how do we make, how do we celebrate and really showcase that this is happening? Yeah. Excellent. So leading on, we've you know, focused on the clinical sector, the education sector. Just wanted to shift now to the research um, sector. Um, and just how, and whoever's been involved in research, knowing it doesn't just sit in the academic or the um, clinical sector, how, how do you go about integrating research? I might start with you, Scott, um, research into 
the, the minds and hearts and hands of, of, the, of the nurses? Yeah, look, I mean, that's a tricky one, mm. Kylie. Um, look, fundamentally, boom, boom. Um, <laughs> look, most of that would translate into procedure. Right, so you'd have evidence-based practice procedures that people are, that then my team are educating from. Um, it's really interesting and difficult um, because even though we know that uh, education research is completely fundamental, organisations actually have to, um, even though they value that, they need to value that in different ways. And that includes things like maintaining um, dedicated quarantine time for research and education activities, um, creating FTE to support um, increasing the visibility and research literacy of our nursing staff so it becomes um, an accepted way of practice. Um, I don't think in some HLHNs we're not quite there yet. We're getting there with co uh, um, co-joint appointments between universities and LHNs, which is great. Um, but we also need to foster that from within and I think, um, well, from my network, we're not quite there yet. Um, it's still in its infancy. But I think as soon as we can start to, um, I guess, quarantine um, that time, acknowledge and value what these research roles bring and how it can actually impact clinical practice, um, there's a little bit to go still. Yeah. Can I, sorry, can I just add one thing that from the clinical practice um, point of view, um, I think we're trying to get nurses to get excited and, and, and do these, and I'm not going to call them extra tasks, but if they're not doing them already, they are extra tasks. But I think we also need to focus on, and I know Scott's a big fan of this, that if we're going to um, implement new evidence-based practice care um, and you know encourage research and, and free up time for that, we need to remove the non-value-adding tasks that nurses do every day, because there's no space for anything else. Um, and until we can do that, um, nurses don't have the headspace to take on any more. So it's the admin tasks and all those things that nurses shouldn't be doing. But even some nursing duties that are not value adding, but it's just the way we've always done it. So challenging the evidence base behind things and making room for the research. We, we um, uh, have a collaboration with Adelaide Uni. So we're only a, St Andrews is only a smallish hospital, but uh, you know there's they do 17,000 surgeries a year. Um, and with that collaboration, we've seen an increase in research. So recently, um, our research project, which has run over a couple of years, is to um, address you know, perioperative hypothermia. Um, that project um, has gone from a project to a research project. It's um, been published and it's changed our practice um, throughout the hospital which has been, you know, just um, for us, it's just a demonstration how that collaboration has worked and, and changed patient care outcomes. Can I just add as well, I think um, the co-joint appointments that we've got across the local health networks and certainly within private industry have been phenomenal. Um, and there's really a, a focus on trying to integrate the workforce in some of those research yeah. projects. But if, from a South Australian uh, public sector perspective, if research is not a career trajectory within, our, within the EA. And I think as nursing leaders, there's an opportunity to actually push that. So we have clinical, we have education, management, et cetera. But research is one of those pillars that actually underpins the profession. And I think there's an opportunity there for our nursing leaders to actually articulate that and to really elevate that. We do have someone in the audience today who's actually in a research position as a nurse down the back. But that, that is an individual who's very, very passionate and um, is pushing and engaged in research. We need to have more positions, not just the co-joint positions. We need to have our own staff embedded. I say our own. I've, I don't work at SA Health anymore. But we have to have staff embedded within those divisions, the clinical areas, who are actually at the coal face themselves, clinicians who can actually understand research and work with the research um, team within their organisations, but also those co-joint appointments as well. But I really believe we need to get research within the public sector EA as a, a clear um, career trajectory for our nurses and, and midwives, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add, Kylie, sorry, um, I'd also encourage people to say yes to opportunities to research. And um, 12 years ago, I had the opportunity to be involved in a uh, research project that measures person-centred practice. So there are eight nursing midwifery KPIs that are around fundamentals of care. So was care given against identified need? Uh, was the nurse midwife competent? Did I feel safe um, in the care of the nurse midwife? Uh, there's five more. Um, but 
that was a methodology that engages nurses, midwives and consumers into um, identifying if um, person-centred care had been delivered. And that's gone from, a, um, I guess, measuring the methodology to now it's been developed into an application that the Nursing Midwifery Office has invested in with New South Wales and Ireland. And that application is now being um, implemented to uh, really look at the implementation of digital um, applications, um, how effective they are in the clinical area. So that will be hopefully starting um, in Nalan in the next few months. So, you know, that was from 12 years ago. I never imagined that that research would have been continuing, but it's actually measuring exactly what we're talking about today. So even if you think you're not a researcher or don't think you might have that skill set, you do, and you can learn on the way and say yes to it and, and join in. I might just open up to the floor. So does anyone have any questions that they want to direct to the panel? To use their insightfulness and gain their wisdom? So we at the front, <laughs> just by people think. And it can be anything, there's no silly question either. Susan, um, okay. uh, not a question so much as an observation. And what I've enjoyed, and, and Carleen, you just did it then, was uh, talking about we. Because I think that we, we get caught up in this narrative of the other and what other people need to do. Leaders need to do this, nurses need to do that. And, and you know, I think moving to a more collective discourse where we talk about what we need to do and achieve together is a much more constructive place to start mm. from. And so I've heard a couple of you do that during, you know, as you've been talking, and you were saying, oh, I'm, I'm not that anymore. I'm, you know, I don't work there anymore. But you did talk about what we need. And I think that that's a really good place to start mm. from. So I really appreciate it, actually, that, that comment. So thank you. Thank you. Craig? I think it took me about the first six years of my career to learn that nursing was more than being good at doing tasks. So I was TNT for a long time. Um, I, how do we help new nurses coming through undergraduate programs and the places where they're going to be providing clinical care have a good connection on the understanding of how to not be TNT, but how to link better and be interconnected with fundamental patient outcomes. Because it feels like there's agreement here, but also some differences in understanding about what a, what a new graduate comes into the workforce ready with. And is there a gap there that we need to think about a bit more? Greg, I think um, from my perspective, I think there's got to be the balance of both. Um, so, um, like I said, we, you need to focus on fundamentals. That's how things, and from fundamentals, big things grow. Um, but we still need a workforce that can still set up infusions. We still need a workforce that can under that can look under look underwater underwater seal drains, for example. Um, so it's fine. It's just I think it's melding those two together. Um, but it's I think it's a continual messaging and the role modelling. Um, and I don't think that's a bit we get right yet, um, particularly with our new staff. So. Um, it, from my position um, and the department that I have the luxury of leading, we support nearly 400, 400 plus um, baby nurses um, within central Adelaide. Um, so it's that continual narrative that we keep trying to talk to them about, saying if you get your fundamentals right, everything will grow. Um, I think it's also partly about identifying what those core capability sets are for those areas that people are working in. Um, but knowing that these capability sets are, I guess, on top of what you come already with and what you're already trained to do at university. So, um, and, and I think it, it is a big mindset shift for people because they come into a clinical space and, and I think they're almost used to doing checklists and logbooks to go, I need to get these skills signed off. And they still have that same mindset when they come into grad programs sometimes, that I still need to make sure I can tick this off and I can do this. Um, but it's our job to say, that's an adjunct to you being a nurse and looking after people who are actually real, you know, they're real people with real lives that um, we need to support. So I think it's just trying to meld and smoosh them, because that's a very technical word, um, smoosh them together, um, but it's how we do that. Can I just add to that? I think one of the challenges we have, and I was listening to someone talk yesterday about constructive alignment, and when we're talking about, you know, most of us, if we think about that novice to a proficient continuum that Benner talks about, and we have the undergraduate nursing students and the graduate nurses who are at that sort of advanced beginner novice level. Um, one of the things that I think we as 
you know, capable, competent, expert, proficient practitioners need to remember is we know this stuff intuitively, okay? So we can make the link from A to Z, but we didn't have to worry about everything in between. And I think it's incumbent upon us to actually take that time, mentor, role, model, support individuals to be able to understand how to link and think. Because role modelling in of itself is you, what, you might watch someone, you might observe someone, but it also is the art of con uh, communication and being to, able to explain that when I'm linking and thinking, and you might not use those words, but you know, when I'm doing my, I'm, I'm assisting you know, Vincent here with his breakfast in the morning, um, what I'm also doing is I'm having a conversation with Vincent to ascertain his cognitive ability, you know, his, how did he sleep last night, all of, I'm asking him a range of questions, what his demands are, what his desires are, his discharge planning, all of those sorts of things. And I don't think we do that as well as we could. So we're probably not role modelling the linking and thinking as well as we, we do. And it probably looks like, from the novice's perspective, that the proficient person is doing task and, you know, task mm. and time. But in actual fact, they are linking and thinking. So I yeah. think we have to get better at articulating that for our nurses who perhaps haven't quite got that understanding yet. And there's a strategy, a strategy that's been really effective is the working with wisdom and T2P supports. They have been um, role modelling that and breaking that down. So I think that's a really, really been an excellent strategy um, led by the nursing midwifery office. And I think time is a really important thing as well with that. Um, and, that and, and you're right, it's that whole novice expert type of pathway. Um, but if I reflect um, as a community nurse, like I'd go in to do a medication like when somebody's home but it's amazing what you pick up just through intuitive work practices that I can you go in to do a task which is the meds but I've looked at the sink I've checked the fridge I've checked the bathroom I've looked at them I've looked at the bed You're I've not intuitive at, no no I'm not um, no I'm really not um, no no but they're not intuitive they're that, that's right but but it also the, some of that language though, if you'd look at the Australian skills uh, core framework it uses the word um, intuition um, at expert level, and that's a really hard thing to articulate too, because what is intuition? But it actually uses that type of terminology and that framework um, when it comes to learning. So it's it's actually quite interesting how we we still need to try and let them be junior nurses, but we've got to build them up because it's time and frequency of exposure. We just can't expect seniors to happen no. by that second no. year because it doesn't work that way. I think we have a question from the audience at the back. So just grab a mic so everyone can hear. <laughs> Um, I had a student nurse working with me last week, and we did the tick boxes, of course. And at the end of it, I actually said to her, is there anything I could do better? And she was actually quite, you know, um, she said, I've never had that asked before. You know, so it's not just about them learning. It's about what we can do as well to make it better for them. Okay. Brilliant. That is great. And we have just one more question there. Yeah. Hi, I work as a student facilitator role as well, and uh, I think I just like you know when I uh, like you know facilitate the students for like you know actually in the workplace, I say like you know what do you think when your family member or your loved one in this bed, how would you expect what kind of care you want, and I emphasize that things and I say like you know even we are a human being, at least you ask someone like how your day being, how did you sleep well, or what kind of day you already been. It's just make a difference, like because it's a build your trust with that person mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think usually I say students like, you know, if like some students come with like, you know, the some values and compassion and like passionate with the nursing and all of stuff. Some are materialistic, they think about the money and stuff. I said, like, you still need to build that values and beliefs. Like, you know, you are helping someone to recover from that disease or, like, any, like, you know. And I think some of students build that, like, you know, the qualities. And I think sometimes I be as a role model, like, you know, if something, like, you know, patients come across with, like, you know, major, like, you know, disease diagnosis or something like that, on that time, how you approach them what kind of help they need. You don't go beyond your scope, but at least you be there, it's make more difference. So sometimes the students just say like, you know, I never come across with kind of facilitating thing and they like build that, like, you know, the core values as well. So I feel like, you know, if you have on that position, I probably just say like, you know, pass it on what your compassion and what's your passion about nursing. Mm -hmm. It make difference, I think. Great, thank yeah. you for sharing that. Just mindful, Ed. Sharing um, positive um, patient feedback, yeah. and especially with the graduates, 
you know, it's, it's really empowering for them because if somebody write, takes the time to write a letter or put, yeah. put comments in, um, actually giving it to them, it makes a big difference to their, you know, progression and their confidence. Yeah, that's nice. So just, I'll just end with just one last question. So brief answers, everyone, because we're a smidgen over time. So we have talked about the different sectors, the clinical, the education, the research, the importance of compassion. Um, what I would like a, a short answer, knowing that we are the JBI Global Solutions Room and this is the Global Solutions Week, what are some solutions or strategies, um, just quick one, things that you think we need to be focusing on, need to be the driver for the future? And I think we've touched on some of these already about joint roles, but just, uh, you know, what, what do you think should, would be the next priority? Um, and how can we get those three sectors to work and align better, work together better? So I'll start with Colleen. Is it I'm, one word? I'll, I'll just say network. Yeah. That sustained commitment to networking. Yeah, excellent. I guess it's the concept of paternalism. Um, we don't always know better than the person receiving care and we need, we need to connect that. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Thanks, Scott. Um, I think uh, removing those, you know, policy or system obstacles that stop nurses from doing it now. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. I'd probably say um, compassion and flattening the hierarchy mm -hmm. and ensuring we're co-creating with, um, with all partners, industry. I think um, um, I liked your comment about the we, and I think that that's really important that you know you're all in it together um, in your organisation and you know across the uh, profession, um, and also uh, communication, being open, transparent, and deep listening. So you're actually really hearing what people are saying. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. So with that, please um, join me in welcoming the panel members today. So we'll give them a cup. We're about to go off for our morning tea break, which is at the back. Um, and the room will be just rearranged for a little bit for the next session. We're due back at 11 o'clock. So please, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.